Minor. He received an MA in Ancient Near Eastern Studies from BYU and his PhD from UCLA in Egyptology. He taught courses in Hebrew and religion part-time at BYU and the UBSC Extension Center, as well as in history at Cal Poly Pomona and UCLA. He also taught early morning seminary and at the Westwood or UCLA Institute of Religion. Uh, his first full-time appointment was a joint position in religion and history at BYU Hawaii. He is the director of the BYU Egypt Excavation Project. He and his wife, Julianne, are the parents of six children, and together they have lived in Jerusalem while Carrie is taught there. He served as the chairman of the National Committee for the American Research Center in Egypt, and on the board for the annual meeting of the Society for the Study of Egypt, Egyptian Antiquities. He was named one of the top 300 professors in the nation by the Princeton Review. His favorite thing in the world to do is cool things with his wife and children. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm excited to be with you all today. Uh, it's just a great thing to be doing on a, a beautiful day. I saw just a second ago someone over there, someone walking in with the UCLA. Uh, Sweatshirt made me feel happy and thank you for the game today with Morgan, so we'll wish them luck. Um, but anyway, I'm just excited to be with you all. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly glad to have my wife here today. I remember uh, four years ago when uh, the last time we had a spare symposium on the Old Testament, I was doing a presentation on Ruth. I really liked that presentation. They, they filmed for that one, and uh, there was no one to tell me that my tie had come out and was sitting on the outside of my suit jacket for the full hour of that thing that's on BYU TV that people watch. So uh, since that time, she wasn't able to come with me uh, at that time. So uh, since then, I've, I've learned that I, there are many reasons that I need my wife, but that's one. Anyway, um, I usually like to kind of stand out front and wander around uh, a little bit and talk with people, but today we're going to be into the text a lot, and it's a little, with the screen right behind me, it's a little bit hard to read the screen on the text, so I'll frequently come back here behind the podium to read uh, the scriptural text that we put up on the uh, on the board, and I hope you'll forgive me for kind of hiding back behind that fact that I better start now. So let's start out by reading something from the Psalms that just kind of introduces our topic. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. A fire goeth before him, and burneth up his enemies round about. His lightnings enlighten the world. I think this, this psalm, in some ways, encapsulates the, the various elements that I'm trying to talk about here. We expect, when you read descriptions about God, we expect to see things like uh, light and enlightening. But darkness and clouds are not, what, as Latter-day Saints, we typically think of. Um, but I've found that consistently these two things are paired together, light and darkness, when we describe the presence of the Lord. Not every time, but fairly consistently. And today I hope that we can explore a little bit some of the reasons why that might be and what we might learn theologically from it. And uh, I have to be honest with you that actually my, my mind has changed about this even during the last week as I've been getting ready for this presentation and it's caused me to think about things. It's one of the drawbacks. I think it's wonderful that we... Um, we get these papers done so far ahead of time, and we get them in, and they're published so that when people come here, they can buy the book. But the, the drawback to that is, is that whenever you write something, you think about something in a certain way, and whenever you think about presenting it to other people and having interaction, you think about it in another way. The best thing is to write, then present, then go back and rewrite and, and publish, and we don't have the opportunity with this. So. Uh, I'm, you're going to get some things that are a little bit different than in, in the book. You'll get what's in the book as well, but I think another step beyond that. Um, and uh, maybe one day I'll write a rebuttal to myself. Uh, <laughs> I've done that before, I'll probably do it again. Anyway, we're going to explore this interplay between themes of darkness and light when people see God in the Old Testament. <clears throat> now, we're only going to examine uh, encounters where it's certainly God's presence. There are lots of times where someone hears the voice of God uh, or something like that. Cain hears God talking, but I don't know that he sees God. And what we're looking at is the kind of visual um, interplay between these elements. So we're, we're only going to look at uh, examples where it's pretty clear that someone has seen the Lord. I have one exception that uh, it's not clear about that, that that I put in here that we'll look at. But um, for the most part, we're going to look at examples where someone actually sees God. Now, one of the things you'll notice is that, that these writers really struggle
struggle trying to describe what it's like to see the Lord. And you get that in the Doctrine and Covenants, you get it in Joseph Smith's First Vision accounts. Um, and, and when you think about it, really, how can you describe that? How can you describe something that is beyond the experience of anybody who's not actually experienced it? And that's not very many people. I think it does defy description. I think it's impossible for people to describe because there just aren't words that exist. And if there were, those who haven't gone through it wouldn't understand what those words meant. Um, and so you're going to see often as we read descriptions of God that people are just kind of struggling with how do I, how do I describe what I saw? And they, they use various ways of trying to do it. So with that background information, let's jump in. We're going to look at the Genesis accounts. And the Genesis accounts are actually a little bit different than what you find thereafter. Um, and I, I, I'm kind of toying around still with why that may be as part of what the, I've been going through this last week. So in Genesis, we read uh, Abraham. They, Abraham sees the Lord a few times. In Genesis 17, we get the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. That's it. Right? That's the whole description. And that's one of the uh, interesting things about Genesis is that they typically don't try and describe God. They just say they saw God. Now, there may be a number of reasons for that. We'll explore some of them as we go along. But one of them may be Genesis is just different than the rest of the Bible anyway. Right? It's almost the, the prelude to the rest of the Bible. The, the Old Testament is predominantly the story of the house of Israel uh, from the Exodus on. And Genesis is basically to tell you how they got into Egypt, uh, how, how its covenant was established and how they got into Egypt. And it's, it's just, a, a, I don't know, the stories flow differently. It's just a, a different kind of a book because it's so much important, heavy material in a long period of time condensed into a few pages. Um, so I, I've even heard some scholars refer to it as the Old Testament of the Old Testament. Uh, and the way that the Old Testament is different than the New Testament, it kind of prefigures what's going to happen. And I, I think there's something to that. So that may be one of the reasons why uh, these accounts are a little bit different in Genesis. Uh, there might be some other reasons we'll look at as we go along. But again, with this one, all we get is the Lord appeared unto Abra Abram. That's it. All right? In Abraham chapter 3, which is from this same time period, different document, but same time period, we get a similar thing. Thus I, Abraham, talked with the Lord face to face as one man talketh with another. And he told me of the works which his hands had made. He just tells us he saw him. He doesn't describe it to us at all, what it's like to see him. He just tells us he saw him. Now this one, it's not actually clear if he saw the Lord or not. It, it seems probably not. I don't know that we can... It's, a, it's an interesting and somewhat difficult passage, but it definitely has light and darkness interplay in it. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, No, I assure you that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. So you, you get the great darkness element here, and you get dark and smoking furnace, but also a burning lamp. So a little bit of an interplay between light and darkness, but it's a strange enough passage grammatically, uh, theologically. We're not sure exactly what is happening here, but it does have the, that interplay in it. When we get the story of uh, Jacob and the vision he has of Jacob's ladder, the full extent we get of describing what the Lord looks like is the Lord stood above it, above the, the ladder, right? That's, that's it. It doesn't tell us anything about the appearance of the Lord. Similar, similarly, there's even less in the wonderful account about Jacob wrestling with an angel. Uh, it's not really doesn't say much about seeing God there at all. The only thing we have is that afterwards it says, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Uh, before this, it talks about him wrestling with an angel. So it's hinted at that he sees God, but surely we, we don't get much of a description there. Later, when he tries to take his, his family back to see God, we get this, and God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Paddan Aram and blessed him and he says, Thy name is Jacob, thy name shall not be called anymore Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel, and God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And he goes on to talk to him, and eventually God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. Again, that's it. It doesn't, nothing about the, what the Lord looks like. So, those are... Uh, the, the Genesis accounts. There's really very little in the way of light 
of darkness there because there's very little about actually what God looks like in the first place. Uh, and that's how it is in Genesis, but it changes after this. And we get, uh, from here on out, it's fairly consistent that they're going to try to describe what God looks like, and they're going to use elements of light and darkness in that. So, it starts in Exodus. The next thing we get after Genesis is Moses seeing God. And, and certainly, we get here, here we only get a, an account of lightness. We'll come back to why that may be later. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Clearly, elements of light in here. In fact, when I compare this with some of Joseph Smith's accounts from the first vision, uh, it seems to me they're trying to describe the same thing. In some of Joseph's accounts in the first vision, he talks about, it, it, in the account we're familiar with, uh, that we have in the Full of Great Price, he says it's brighter than the light of the noon day. But in earlier accounts, he says it was like a fire. And when you think about it, these are the two things they have to compare bright lights to, right? The sun and fire. Um, and he says it's like a fire. In fact, it was so much like a fire that he thought that when this light hit the, the trees, that they would burst into flames. And he was pretty pleased when they didn't, because now he thought maybe he would survive this whole thing, rather than burning up. Um, and and they, it seems like they're on fire, except for that they're not burning. Is his description, which is so similar to Moses' here. I think that's what he's saying. That there was so much light coming out of the bush, it was like it was on fire, except it wasn't burning up. Right? And so light is the quintessential element of this encounter for Moses uh, as he first comes to the burning bush. When they're in the wilderness, we get more of this interplay between light and darkness. We know that uh, the Lord goes with them, and the Lord went before them daily in a pillar of a cloud to lead them in the way, and nightly in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by daily and nightly. He did not take away from before the people the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night. So this is symbolic of the presence of the Lord. And there may be some good practical reasons for this as well. Out in a desert area, very hot during the day, cool at night, it's nice to have a cloud during the day and a fire at night. Um, but it's interesting that we get those same bits of interplay here, where he's both a cloud and a fire. And we're going to see that continue. Um, the next thing we see is when the Egyptian, you remember the story, it's uh, wonderful in the Ten Commandments and Prince of Egypt and all these great movies. The Egyptians arrive on the scene and they want to destroy the Israelites. This is something that's always difficult in these movies. They have a hard time depicting this the way it's described because I, I can't figure out how you would depict it the way it's described in here. Um, it says, and it was a cloud of darkness to them and it gave light by night to thee. So meaning to, to one of the groups, it's a cloud of darkness, and but it's giving light to the other, so that one came not near the other all the night. Um, and in the morning, watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud. So the Lord's in there, apparently. He's looking at them out of this. But it's both a cloud and a fire at the same time. And some people are beholding it as a fire, and some as a cloud. It's an interesting uh, little interplay there. When they get up to Mount Sinai, we really see this uh, coming to light. They, um, they have to get ready. So before we read that, let's talk about this. The Lord tells them that he wants to come down in the presence of all of Israel. And he tells Moses, tell the people to sanctify themselves. They need to wash their clothes and, and uh, sanctify themselves and set a boundary around the mountain so they don't go up there when they're not supposed to. And, and just spend three days preparing to see God. That's important. We'll come back to that. On the third day in the morning, there were thunders and lightnings and a heavy cloud upon the mount. And the voice of the trumpet was very strong, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And all of Mount Sinai was smoking, because the Lord descended upon it in a fire. And its smoke ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. Now, we've got uh, these, these light. Uh, and fire elements, but also the smoke, right, which is natural. Again, there's a natural element to this. When you have smoke, there's fire, and when you have fire, there's smoke, right? But this will, again, uh, serve to have uh, some, some hiding and some revealing elements to it. Uh, I love this little um, depiction here that just kind of gives you the idea of how much light there is, but there's also a cloud. But in here, the cloud is only up on the top. I'm not sure that's exactly how it is, because the cloud seems to be hiding the presence of God. Uh, and 
And it's while this is happening that all of Israel hears the voice of God giving the Ten Commandments. We don't often don't think of that. But they hear God de deliver the law. Uh, and afterwards, they tell Moses, actually, you go talk to God. We'll stay here. This, this is too much. It's too much for us. Why should we die, they say. You go see God, we won't. That's, that's an important and crucial element. All right? Uh, now, this reminds me a little bit of something we read in section 38. The day soon cometh that ye shall see me and know that I am. For the veil of darkness shall soon be rent, and he that is not purified shall not abide the day. So, this is about being able to see God, which is what's happening at Mount Sinai. And it is as I've been looking at these Doctrine and Covenants verses that I've kind of had my mind change a little bit of, of what may be going on. God wants to reveal himself to the, the children of Israel. He wants for them to see him. And so he wants to, to, to change the veil of darkness. This is what he's saying. Ye shall see me and know that I am for. So this is, this is how you will see me. The veil of darkness shall soon be rent. It is this darkness that is separating them from the presence of God. It, it creates a veil. This cloud, as it were, creates a veil for the children of Israel. Um, and then the, the problem is that if they're not purified, they won't be able to survive that experience. Remember that God has Israel purify themselves for three days so that they can see him. They're still not sure they'll make it. Now, that's an interesting story in and of itself that I've talked about in another very symposium. But, um, but the point here is that God wants to reveal himself to them the darkness is separating them, and purification is necessary to overcome that. Keep that in mind. We'll come back to that. As we continue on, we read, The mountain burned with fire under the midst of heaven with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. All right, so this seems to be two different kinds of darkness. Anyway, lots of things. So you've got fire, but you also have the, the, the darkness and clouds and thick darkness. This interplay, both happening at the same time. The essential elements uh, of the Sinai experience seem to be that there's quaking, there's thunder, there's light, and there's, there's smoke or darkness. They're tied up together. Uh, so the quaking and thunder, we can kind of understand displays of power or something. But there you have that light and that darkness again. Um, and, and this is, a, again, the element that we often don't expect to find associated with God. As they continue on, we get this again. The Lord spoke out of the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the heavy darkness. He's in the midst of all of them. Right? And Moses says, Ye heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire. So the voice is coming from there again. Both elements are combined. All the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. This is when they're starting to become afraid of this presence of the Lord. But again, you've got the, the lightnings and the mountain smoking. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. This is when they make that decision that Joseph Smith says, this is the reason why they will get the lower law. Because God wanted to bless them with the greater blessing, and they refused it, uh, being afraid. They let their fear overcome them. Uh, it's a lack of faith, really. And thus they, they received the lower law. Um, but that's in the midst of this element uh, of, of the uh, light and the darkness. Now, Moses then will go up to talk to God instead. And when Moses approached God, he drew near to the thick darkness where God was. So God is inside the darkness. Moses will approach it, and he will go through the darkness, uh, which is what the children of Israel weren't willing to do. Later, God tells Moses to bring 70 of the uh, elders of Israel up. Then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet it was like the paved work of a sapphire stone, and it was like the body of heaven in its clearness. For them there is no darkness element. It's, the light is only implied when you start talking about sapphire and a clear body of heaven. That's, that's not strong language for light, but it's implied there. But there is no darkness as they have gone, again, through the darkness, now into God's presence. To see God. Um, and then they, they, they have a, a covenantal meal with the Lord, and then after seeing God and eating, drinking this covenantal meal, Moses left that 70, the rest of the group, and he went into the mount to visit with God. As Moses went further, the cloud covered the mount. So it seems that they've been allowed to see God to some degree. Now 
the cloud will come and separate them as Moses is going to spend even more time with God. So you have the children of Israel who are down here who are not seeing God at all. They're only seeing light and darkness. Then you have 70 elders of Israel who have gone through the darkness and they've seen God uh, as they've, they've gone up a level and seen God. And then you have uh, Moses who will leave this 70 behind and they stop seeing God and have darkness again. And Moses goes even further up and enjoys more communion with God. And the glory of the Lord tabernacled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days, and he called to Moses on the seventh day. So this is right after that. So Moses goes further into the darkness. He has to wait six days. And he called to Moses on the seventh day from the midst of the cloud, and the glory of the Lord appeared as a consuming fire on the top of the mount in the sight of the children of Israel. So as Moses finally goes through that cloud, after seven, six days of preparation, um, of some kind of preparation, and I don't know what that preparation is, but then you will go through and you get the cloud again, but also that <coughs> consuming fire, the light in, in great display. And note how here glory, and we'll explore this more fully later, but glory is associated with the consuming fire. Later we get that the cloud pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and he the Lord talked with Moses. So this is when God is going to talk with Moses at the tabernacle, but it's in a cloud pillar. And just after that, the, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. So this is another time when God speaks to Moses face to face. Um, now, keep that in mind. That's in chapter 33, because we end up with a bit of a strange paradox, where just after Moses has seen God face to face, we read, uh, in, that was in verse 11, verse 20 through 23, God says, You are not able to see my face, for no man will see me and live. If we look at the Joseph Smith translation, we get uh, being added here, you are not able to see my face at this time, for no man will see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you will stand upon the rock, and it shall come to pass when my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and will cover you with my hand until I have passed by, and I will take away my hand, and you will see after me, but my face shall not be seen. Interesting that Moses sees God face to face, and just after that, he is told he can't see God. He can't see God's face. Again, there's this interplay between hiding and, and revealing uh, that we have going on here. Moses again ascended the mount where the Lord descended in the cloud. So after this, Moses goes up again. God comes down in a cloud. And it is after that then that Moses spends so much time visiting with God that when he comes down, he has to veil his face. Uh, and I guess this has been transfigured for so long that the change that comes upon his body doesn't immediately go away. Now he is radiant. God's presence has had this effect on him. He's radiant. Now the children of Israel can't take Moses' presence. His nature has been changed so substantially that they can't take his presence for a while. Eventually this will wear off. But the light of God affects Moses to where Moses is too bright a source of light for the children of Israel. I think we have these gradations of, of communion with God that we see again. All right, that's it for the Exodus accounts. We'll come back to those uh, in a minute as we explore this a little bit further. But let's look at some of the other accounts where we see God. Um, one of the, really the next account we get is in 1 Kings uh, at the temple dedication. The cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Then spake Solomon, the Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. So that's interesting because we're getting cloud and glory here. Um, we have to explore exactly what this word means, the word glory. And to do that, let's look at actually the next account where someone sees God. And we'll start to look at what the word glory, how the different ways it's used. Then we'll come back to this account as well. So the next account where someone sees God is Isaiah's call. And you're going to see the word glory used there as well. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. All right, so we're going to look at that word glory for a second here. Um, the, the Hebrew word is kavod, um, and, and literally it, has, it means weight or heaviness. A heaviness about you. Uh, another way we would say it is a gravitas, right? This is a heaviness that is 
appropriate to your station, appropriate to your importance. That's how the, that's the root meaning of the word. But it ends up being used coming from that understanding of someone's importance or or their gravitas, really. Um, it, it takes on some other meanings. So it, it comes to mean social status or power. But it also will come to be associated often with fire and with life. And some of the accounts that we have seen, I think that's clearly what's going on. We saw one where definitely glory was associated with life. I think that's what's happening in the temple dedication as well. That's their way of describing his life. Um, let's look at a couple of examples that help us see that this is often associated with life. This is from Isaiah. Uh, you've probably read this verse before. Arise, shine forth, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. If we separate this into, into parallelistic patterns where they say one thing and then they say it again in a similar way, we see that light and glory are, are used similarly. Uh, we can also see again here, glory and brightness are used similarly. Uh, so in this case, they're synonyms. Um, we get it uh, here as well, light and glory. Um, there are a whole bunch of places, and we won't take the time to read them all. I'm already putting you to sleep. This will put you to sleep more if we read them all. But in all of these places, glory and light are just directly equated with each other. So while glory sometimes means a heaviness, in most of the cases we're reading, I think it does mean light. It means that there, there's a light-filled element there. So we go back to this Isaiah again, and we're not going to read the whole thing, but let's look at some of the different uh, elements of light and darkness. So again, we have that glory filling the house, as we talked about. One of the elements of light is the seraphim. Now, that comes from the word seraph, which actually means to burn. Uh, and this is probably best translated, if we're going to be literal, as fiery burning ones. Uh, burning beams, we could say. Again, I think we would just say these are light-filled beams. They don't know how else to describe them other than that they are filled with light, or fire if you prefer. Um, and you have this element of the Lord's train filling the temple, and presumably this is from his robe. Uh, and it's not a fire or a, a dark element, but it fills the whole temple, which is an aspect of glory. They're using this to connote glory, but it also has an element of it that fills the whole temple. It makes it a little difficult to see, so I think the train in and of, of itself has both some revealing and some hiding aspects to it. The house is filled with smoke, presumably from the altar, but again, it's filled with smoke. That sounds similar to what we are reading in Exodus. Um, and then you have these burning ones coming with a live coal. So uh, a light-filled element is there, and that live coal will purify Isaiah and make him able to be there and do what God would have him do. So there's a purpose behind this particular element of light. Now, if we go back to the, the dedication of the temple, if we assume that glory is a, an element of light, we've got the, house, the cloud, or darkness, filling the, the house of the Lord, and glory uh, is also filling it, right? And then Solomon says, the Lord said he would dwell in thick darkness. Solomon is, it's clear to Solomon they can't go through this darkness to where the Lord is. And so he remembers that God says, he, he said he would dwell in a thick darkness. Let's look at uh, the Ezekiel accounts as well. Ezekiel has some very interesting visions. We want to explore all the strange creatures he sees and things like that. We're going to concentrate on the appearance of the Lord there. So, when he sees the Lord, he says, Above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone, this brightness that's coming from it. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above, above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, this kind of reddish color, right, um, as the appearance of fire round about it, round about within it. So, oh, I don't know why fire, I meant to highlight fire there, but anyway, we've got the fire there, and from the appearance of his loins even upwards, and from the appearance of his loins even downwards, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so that was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. All right, so this is all light-filled stuff. 
you could make an argument um, that, that the bow, which I think is the rainbow, which is light, but it's usually associated with rain and there are clouds and so on. You could make an argument that there's some darkness there, but I think maybe, but I don't think that's the emphasis in it, and it's a fairly tentative conclusion. I think that this is largely a light-filled encounter, and he's not experiencing dark. Um, so keep that in mind. We'll come back to it again. Uh, this is part of what I've been figuring out this last week, that maybe there is a reason behind when there's light and darkness and when there's just light. Let's look at another vision from Ezekiel. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. This is a vision of the temple, right? So again, you've got the cloud filling the inner court and the glory uh, on the threshold of the house. And then the house is filled with cloud and also with the brightness of the Lord's glory. So both in and out of the temple, you have both light and dark elements, cloud and fire elements. Uh, then in this vision of the great uh, temple, the millennial temple, we get this description. And we won't read the whole thing, but uh, he says it's like the vision which he saw earlier. And we've just read the account of that vision. And then he says, I fell upon my face, and the glory of the Lord came into the house by way of the gate, whose prospect is towards the east. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. It's very interesting that in this vision, the vision of a temple yet to come, the millennial temple, we don't get the dark elements. There's no element of darkness here at all. It's only glory. Uh, and uh, presumably then lightens, right? And that's strengthened by this idea that it's towards the east where the sun comes. All right, so why do we have both elements? Those are the accounts that we, we have of someone seeing God and trying to describe his presence. Uh, and so now we have to ask ourselves, why do we get both elements? As Latter-day Saints, we're, we don't expect to have a dark element associated with God, to have a cloud associated with God. But I think as, as you've seen what we've looked at here, there are elements in that darkness or that cloud that are familiar to us as Latter-day Saints. And that is that, that, that we are separated from the presence of God unless he is ready to bring us into the, his presence and wants to have us there and we're prepared for it. I think that's what we're going to see is that, that there, God is both trying to reveal himself to us and yet at the same time has to hide himself from us because we're not ready to see him. Um, let's look at this. This is from Moses, but this is from his vision that's in Moses chapter 1. In fact, before we look at that, let me just tell you, we don't know exactly when the vision, it's a wonderful vision. Moses chapter 1 is just an incredible uh, uh, chapter with beautiful stuff in it. We don't know exactly when that happens, but within the chapter there are two clues. Moses sees God, and then um, God leaves him for a moment. All right, I'm just going to take a drink for a second. Then God leaves him for a moment, and Satan comes. And when Moses is talking with Satan, he says, I'm not going to cease to call upon God. When God talked to me out of the burning bush, he said, keep calling on me. So that gives us the idea that this happens after the burning bush. Uh, and then when God comes back, Satan leaves and God comes back, God tells Moses that you're going to go deliver the children of Israel. All right, so we've got a time frame that this happened. It's a fairly narrow time frame because right after the burning bush, he goes to deliver the children of Israel. So it's a pretty narrow time frame. In fact, I think it might be actually the same vision. This might be that burning bush experience, just a kind of a higher gospel account of it. And that when Moses is talking to Satan, he says, when God calls me out of the burning bush, he might be saying, you know, just a few minutes ago when he calls me out of the burning bush. But that he's describing a different kind of thing in this higher gospel or higher law account. I don't know if that's the case or not. But in any case, it's, it's a time where Moses surely sees God. And we have this interesting thing from verse 1 and 2. The words of God which he spake unto Moses at a time when Moses was caught up into an exceedingly high mountain. And he saw God face to face, and he talked with him. And the glory of God was upon Moses, therefore Moses could endure his presence. Now that's interesting. Here, glory is not being used to mean light. It, it means some kind of power, some kind of transformative power of God. We know that Moses' fallen nature, like yours and mine, is incompatible with the presence of God. He can't be in God's presence at this time in his fallen state. He has to have his nature changed. We call it transfiguration. He has to have his nature changed in order to stand being in God's presence. And here, 
is described as the glory of God being upon Moses. Therefore, Moses could endure his presence. That's the element that, that we need to keep in mind. Without that, it, we can't come into God's presence. It's a bad thing. That's what the, how the children of Israel sense at Mount Sinai. Without God changing them, they can't survive being in God's presence. Their problem is God has told them he will bring them, and so for whatever reason they're having a struggle with faith, believing that God actually will change them, change their nature, and they will be able to withstand his presence. But God's presence has to be hidden from us unless this transformation is going to take place. A few verses later, this is what God tells Moses. And behold, thou art my son. Wherefore, look, and I will show thee the workmanship of my hands. Here's the important part. But not all. For my works are without end, and also my words, for they never cease. Which is the same thing my students tell me about me. <laughs> anyway, wherefore, no man can behold all my works, except he behold all my glory. And no man can behold all my glory, and afterwards remain the flesh upon the earth. If I understand this verse correctly, what God is telling Moses is, if I were to show you everything that I have done, I would have to change your nature so substantially, you would not be able to go back. Your nature would now be as incompatible with the earth as mine is. Maybe not quite as much as God's is, but he, he won't be able to come back to the earth. And, and as I said, I think we're seeing this almost starting when Moses spends so much time with God that he comes down and, and his face is so light that the children of Israel can't take it. Um, but even then, God's saying, no, I'm just showing you a little bit. I can't show you everything. It would require you to be changed too much. And I need you to stay on, on earth. I've got some stuff for you to do. Right? So, again, that, that element that as much as God wants to reveal himself to us, he can't. He can't fully reveal himself to us at this time. Um, so, here we have the, the Mount Sinai incident again, where... I think as much as God is ready to reveal himself to the Israelites, because they are not ready, they cannot go through the darkness. Others who are more ready do go through that darkness. Remember this person we read, right? He wants to show himself to us. The veil of darkness shall, shall soon be rent, and he that is not purified shall not abide the day. Um, before we move on, let me just uh, talk a little bit about Sinai and, and what I think Sinai means in general. Uh, a few times I've had the opportunity, I guess three times, to, uh, to hike up Mount Sinai, and I've done it with some of you who are, who are here in the room. Um, and when, when you hike up there, each time I've had the chance for about 45 minutes or so to just sit and think as we wait for the sun to rise and so on. And the last couple of times as I sat up there thinking and pondering, what, what's the most important thing that happens at Mount Sinai? And I thought about Moses. Uh, the burning bush, I thought about the children of Israel there, I thought about Elijah when he comes back to Mount Sinai, and it occurred to me that what we see at Mount Sinai is God wants to reveal himself to his children. He really, really wants to have communion with his children. That's what God wants. He wants for this to happen that we talked about. He wants to, to rend the veil of darkness so that we can see him. More than anything, God wants to have communion with them. And you can picture this as a loving parent whose children are separated from him. He wants that communion. And he's capable of changing us, but we have to do something that the children of Israel failed to do. But not all, because some did get to go and have communion with God. I think that's the essence of what's going on here. Remember that the mountain burned with fire in the midst of heaven with darkness, clouds, and a thick darkness. And Moses went up further. Remember we talked about this, the gradations, because he and 70 were prepared and saw him more, and then Moses saw him even more. Uh, God will reveal himself to those who will allow him to reveal himself to them. All right? And then we have the glory of the Lord coming, and it's like a consuming fire. We talked all about this, as Moses at least has this great communion with God. Because, as I said, God so wants to reveal himself to his children. Now, if we were to go back and look at these elements where there's only light and there's not darkness, one I should have had up here that I don't is that first one, the burning bush experience. We have this one with Ezekiel, where it's, it's just light, and a second one with Ezekiel where it's just light. And, and this is part of what I noticed this last week, that those elements are not when it's large groups. The, ele the, the descriptions of God where it's only light and it's not darkness are when it's a prophet who is having real communion with God. 
I think this suggests that this, in those cases, the element of piety is largely dropped. Again, they're not going to see all of God's glory, but they will have real communion with God. The veil is rent. They pass within the veil, as the brother of Jared, uh, the, the phraseology with the brother of Jared that tells us. Uh, that they have pure communion with God without that hiding element. And it's interesting to remember that this was um, about the temple, this vision of Ezekiel that we have up here, where in, in the past we've seen the temple with both light and darkness, but when he sees the millennial temple, it's only light. This is when God will be able to really reveal himself to his children. The temple won't have both a hiding and a revealing element. It will finally have a, only a revealing element. Now, I, that, I, I don't know that this is saying anything about our temples today. I think as people become prepared today and are able to go into temples, that they are in the process of having God reveal himself to them. But in the millennial temple, that will be even more so. Let's read two other things from the Doctrine and Covenants, and, and we'll wrap up. In section 6, we read this, and this is a, a paraphrase of, of John 1. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I am the same that came into mine own, and mine own received me not. I am the light which shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. This phrase is used all over the place. Uh, it's, it starts in John 1, but we see it all, all over the place. Even in the Book of Mormon, we see it in the Doctrine and Covenants several times. This idea of being a light that shines in the darkness, but the darkness doesn't comprehend it. And in the Greek, this, this word, this comprehend, has connotations of not just comprehending, understanding, but of overcoming, right? And typically, I thought of this as a struggle between Satan, and you get this interplay with light and darkness and overcoming darkness and so on, and penetrating darkness. This is all over in the scriptures. And I typically think of this as a struggle between the forces of good and evil, and, and Christ and Satan, and Satan will not come off conqueror. Satan won't understand God, and those who follow Satan won't understand God, but they won't conquer, and Christ will conquer in the end. And I think it is about that. But if you take it to the next step, I think it's also about how God wants to reveal himself to us. And those who won't sanctify themselves, those who won't allow him to, won't understand God. He won't be able to reveal himself to them. But those who are doing what they can to become sanctified will eventually be able to have God reveal himself to them. He, Although he says it in exactly this way a number of times, I am the same that came into my own, receive me not. I am the light which shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. The Lord says that a number of times, especially in the Doctrine and Covenants. One time, he says it slightly differently, that I think has an important nuance in it. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who created the heavens and the earth, a light which cannot be hid in the darkness. He wants to reveal himself to us. And if we will allow him, he will be successful. This is God's great desire to give us immortality and eternal life. And that eternal life means that we get to be with him again. He cannot be hidden in the darkness. If you will allow him, if you will try to sanctify yourself and, and partake of the sanctifying power of the atonement of Jesus Christ, then his life cannot be hidden. You will be able to go through those thick clouds of darkness and come into the glorious, everlastingly bright presence of God. And of that, I promise, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.